it's good to see everybody here. Um, what, what, what I'm going to do is basically uh, talk to you how you take all the information we've got right now and accomplish what you want to do in your sailboat, whether it's a cruising or it's racing, how you collect all that weather information and, and make a good, smart decision. So um, when I started, which was back in the 70s, we had very rudimentary weather models. Um, our jobs each day as forecasters was to plot and analyze a surface map, an 850 map, and a 500 millibar map. Um, and we would have a series of them. We used some like flip charts. And we would figure out how fast the various systems were moving and project them along. That's all we had for tools in the 70s. So Bob Rice was basically the, uh, the dean of weather outing. And he started that in the 1980s. And he asked for volunteers to work with him. So the very first forecast I ever did in weather routing was in 1990 for Rich Wilson. And he was trying to set a record going from San Francisco to New York City. And Bob goes, you got to do a five-day weather routing forecast for him. OK, no problem. I had two surface analyses and a 500 millibar forecast for 72 to 84 hours and a satellite picture that came over a fax machine. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. Now, does anybody remember what happened to Rich Wilson on this record attempt? Correct. So Rich capsized in the first attempt. His second attempt um, in the early 90s, he ended up setting uh, the record. By the time we got up to the, my first Whitbread on site, and it's interesting, I saw Dee Smith here, who navigated on Chessie Racing in this race. We had AB, AVN grid files that went out to 180 hours. Two degree resolution. Two degrees. It's 120 miles. So the optimal routing software always took you way to the south, because that's where Great Circle was. So in the Indian Ocean, they had you down at 65, 70 south. Not a good place to go. So the, the main source of weather information in, in that Whitbread was the weather facts that was produced by the various government agencies around the world. But the navigators in the boats had to be the weatherman to interpret that information. So now we come up to the present day, and we got a slew of weather models. And everybody calls and asks, Ken, what do you think is the best weather model? I think they all stink, OK? But you know what? It's still better than it used to be. The problem is, is exactly what Joe just mentioned. Don't just look at one weather model. Look at all the weather models. Look at what's going on right now, OK? What the current conditions are. Okay? Think about what you want to accomplish. If one weather model has something really, really bad where you want to go, you want it to have a little bit of a second thought. But it, it is very difficult to figure out which weather model is correct and which, which one's wrong. Okay? We have the same problems you guys have. So, and we keep coming back to, um, um, I, I'm going to come back to January 4th. But this is, um, this is uh, I've, I've got a little skin in the game on this one, because I want to get home to New Hampshire on Sunday. So I'm a little concerned whether it's going to ice up there or not. And this is the forecast um, yesterday afternoon for tomorrow morning. So this is the European model. We could see that the low is out here in eastern Kentucky. And just extrapolating, it looks like it's going to be heading for northern New, Hampshire, uh, northern New England. Over on the GFS, the low is a lot weaker. And it looks like it's going to head out south of New England. So which one's going to be right? 
my gut feeling tells me that this one's going to be right because I've seen this model be too weak and too far south many, many times. But that's because I've been looking at it for 30 years. But in actual fact, we won't know until it actually happens. So here we are back to that January 4th storm again, which everybody's talked about so far. We had a client that wanted to go from Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, down to Bermuda. That was his Christmas trip. Christmas trip, Lunenburg to Bermuda, in a 40-foot boat. And it was going to be fun. So the other thing to remember, it was also very, very cold then and a lot of ice. So my comment when he first contacted us, why don't we do this in steps? How about if we go from Lunenburg down to Newport, down to maybe Atlantic City, down to Norfolk, we'll get to warmer places. It's very easy to reach the Gulf Stream, and it's a short crossing, and then we'll go over to Bermuda. Oh, that's such a long ways, Ken. That will take forever. I said, but we can leave tomorrow. No, no, I'll wait for the perfect weather pattern. So he contacted us. Um, this is January 4th. This is forecast for January 4th. He contacted us on uh, New Year's Eve, the 31st. He said, Ken, the, the GFS looks like a perfect pattern. A storm's going to head out. We'll come down behind the storm and head for Bermuda. He goes, when we cross the Gulf Stream, it's going to be strong northerly, but the Gulf Stream is west to east in that part, so we won't have wind against current. He goes, this looks like a really good weather pattern to me. I said, uh, do you look at any other weather models? He goes, no, no. I said, I'll send you a screenshot of this one. <laughs> so that's the European model for the same exact forecast. So he goes, well, what do you think? I said, well, very simply, you leave on the 1st of January. You're going to be on the Gulf Stream as that storm's coming up. If this is right, you'll be fine. If this is right, it's not going to be fine. So my recommendation is you just don't go. He goes, well, I'll get back to you. I may go anyways. So anyways, he chose to not leave. And as we've seen already, here's what ended up verifying at that time. And he would have been right about here. Yeah, real ooh. And the problem is, with that ooh, there's no place you can go other than maybe Portugal. So ultimately, what he decided to do he left Lunenburg, went to Newport, went to Atlantic City, went to Norfolk, and he got there on the 20th of January. Okay, so the whole point of this discussion is very simply, we've got all these weather models and these weather tools, but you yourself have to look at what you want to accomplish. Okay, and how much risk you want to take, and really make a smart, intelligent decision. So uh, the, the, the big thing are the extreme weather conditions that take place during the summer and the winter, winter seasons. During the summer season, it's tropical storms and hurricanes. And as we'll see during the winter season, and what we just saw is that you've got the cold air, the big ocean storms, and the frequent dramatic weather changes, which showed up on Joe's animation there very dramatically. So taking a look at uh, the differences between tropical storms and big winter gales. And we've seen many examples of that. But this is a paragraph from um, Brennan R's house. And Hurricane Bob, which is the bottom paragraph, tracked 30 miles southeast of our house. This one is. Um, 
what was designated as the Superstorm of 1993, and apparently at this point in time, it's now called the Storm of the Century. But both this storm also tracked 30 miles southeast of our house. So the barographs are from two different storms, a tropical storm and a major winter storm that tracked 30 miles from the house. So here's the hurricane, Hurricane Bob. And that's about a 20 millibar drop in about 12 hours. This is the superstorm. It got down to 966 millibars and rattled around at the bottom of the drum for four hours. That drop is uh, close to 60 millibar, over 60 millibars in a space of 18 hours. So this storm is obviously much larger than the hurricane. Whoops. And just to put it back into perspective again, this is Hurricane Katrina. Gulf of Mexico. So Katrina, doesn't, which was a good-sized hurricane, didn't quite fill up the entire Gulf of Mexico. Here's the superstorm or the storm of the century, which went from Labrador all the way down to Nicaragua. And the gales went from the Texas coast all the way out to the Azores. I can route you around this. I cannot route you around that. <laughs> It's not going to happen, <laughs> even in Comanche. So the, the, a couple of stories on the, these systems. Um, so we had a client that called when Katrina was in here. And he wanted to sail from Galveston, Texas to Key West. First off, and, and this is going to be one of my points coming up, why are you doing that this time of the year? You're going to go down to the Keys in the middle of hurricane season? So the, um, anyways, our, one of my forecasters, Tom Mattis, he's been doing this for 40 years. He's there, you really do not want to leave. Once the storm makes landfall, we'll come down behind it. We'll actually have good conditions because normally the prevailing winds are southeast. We'll have northerlies. We'll come behind Katrina and you'll be able to accomplish what you want to do. Now, I want to leave now. So eventually, Tom convinced him to, to hug the coast and he pulled into Pascagoula, Mississippi before Katrina came in. Sad story, didn't find his boat, didn't find him. He refused to leave his boat when he pulled into Mississippi. So the key story is, do it in the appropriate season, and always remember, the boat is not that important. And we had a, um, a client, a, a real good client and friend, write out Hurricane Sandy in Newport, on a mooring in a 60 meter Perini. And he said he would never ever do that again, ever. So on, on this storm, it went from absolutely not existing to 960 millibars up here in 48 hours. So if you had left Galveston in, in nice weather, you wouldn't have made it across the Gulf of Mexico. And that storm, in 24 hours, the Coast Guard performed 100 rescues in the Gulf of Mexico and saved 250 people. And just in the state of Florida on this storm, 47 people were killed by that storm. So the point I'm making on this one is be very careful if you're cruising in the middle of the winter. Okay? As you saw from Joe Sinkowitz's slide, things happen very quickly, very rapidly. The weather models are not going to get the details correct. And just one more story, 
and it dovetails into Joe's animation of the Pacific Ocean. It was about three years, we had a client that um, left Panama Canal, cruised the South Pacific, went over to Australia, worked his way up to Japan, all during the right seasons. He decided in the first week of February he was gonna bring his boat back from Osaka, Japan, to Hawaii. And we saw from Joe's animation, Pacific Ocean's a nightmare. So he's there, we'll talk every single day, maybe twice a day, and I said, it's not gonna make any difference. I said, the only thing I can guarantee you is that you're gonna get absolutely clobbered. I can guarantee it. We can find the best weather window, I can get you across the Curry Shield current, but I can guarantee you within three or four days of you leaving, you are gonna have 50 knots of wind. The only thing we can try to do is that you're reaching your downwind and you won't be upwind. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> so he left, he left Osaka and there was a storm in the fourth day. And it's like, our goal is we're gonna try to get as far south as we possibly can to try to minimize the impact of these storms. But if things go wrong, we're gonna bail out and head south. And I said, we can't turn around and head west back to Japan again. We'll go south, we'll go down to Guam, we'll go some, some island down there, we'll stay down there. No problems, Ken. We won't have any problems with 50 or 60 knots. Double-handed. <laughs> so the, the forecast unfortunately worked out. Storm was coming in, he said, we're all prepared, Everything, the boat's all ready. We didn't hear from him for 36 hours. He torn the mainsail, lost comms. Fortunately, he followed the instructions when it got really, really bad. He headed south. And then he finally delivered the boat from Osaka to Hawaii on June 1st. Much better trip. So, as everybody's mentioned already about um, hurricanes and tropical storm development, sea surface temperature plays a gigantic role. And there's many spots that you can find sea surface temperatures. So if you're out cruising around, if you're going to the South Pacific, you're gonna be down in the Caribbean, watch the water temperatures. But also keep in mind that the warmest ocean temperatures always occur late in the summer and very early in the fall. And that's why whatever ocean you're in, that's where the most activity is going to be. So always keep that in mind. And my recommendation is, if you're going to cruise in the Caribbean and you want to do it in the summertime, do it in June. Don't do it in September. Now, what is going to be kind of interesting coming up is that the, the Volvo Ocean Race just left from Hong Kong, and they're coming down to Auckland. So I, I've got a chart. They're coming from up here, and they're going to come down here. And the, we, we always have several clients in tropical areas that want us to watch for hurricanes, or in this spot, uh, tropical cyclones. And we basically, we try to give them a three or four day heads up and leave. The water temperatures up until the last month or so have been below normal in here. This is um, uh, Fiji, Vanuatu, New Caledonia. They are now above normal. The Volvo race has um, avoided a uh, tropical cyclone forming east of the Philippines. They've got an exclusion zone. They'll be getting down in here probably the last week of February, which is prime hurricane season. And the other thing is, is that the hurricanes in this area take two tracks. They'll head over towards Australia, or they'll come down in this direction, exactly the same direction the boats are coming. So it'll be interesting to watch with the water temperatures warming up and the Volvo fleet coming down there. They've been doing this for several years now without a problem. But at some point in time, luck tends to run out. It ran out of New Orleans, so. But anyways, here's their route. 
coming down this way, they've actually all diverted up in here to try to get some easting for better angles coming through the trade winds. But basically, here's Fiji, Vanuatu, New Caledonia, they're going to be coming right down through the hurricane belt. And that's something I wouldn't recommend for you guys at all. Now, the other thing that's very interesting, it, it, and you've also got to understand the climatology of the, the area that you're in. If you're over, uh, typically Samoa and Fiji are, are hot spots for tropical storms and hurricanes, but you get over into the um, east portions of French Polynesia, the Marquesas, the water temperatures are cold. They don't get them there. But on rare occasions, they'll get them down through uh, Papietti, Tahiti, through that area. And this would be one of those years that that would occur where the water temperatures are warm throughout this whole area. So it's very important for you, if you're in a tropically vulnerable area, to keep an eye on the water temperatures. So the global hurricane seasons, Ken briefly touched on that, but we're, we're pretty comfortable with the Atlantic. There's, on average, is 10 or 12, and the peak of the season is late August through early October. East and North Pacific, where a fair amount of people cruise now, it's an earlier season. We'll start in May there and go through November. The peak is in August and September, and they have more cyclones than we have in the Atlantic. Now, unfortunately, Stan Honey wasn't able to come today. He called me back in October, and I thought it was going to be a friendly conversation, chat about what's going on, but he's cruising down in Costa Rica. At that point in time, he was in Mexico. And he called, Ken, the GFS has a tropical cyclone forming off of Costa Rica. European model doesn't have it. He goes, I'm not sure exactly what to do. So I brought up, I, I don't routinely look in that area. I brought up the weather models. So, yeah, I see what you're talking about, Stan. So let me take a look at the satellite picture. So I took a look at the satellite picture, and there's a big blob of clouds, just like Ken McKinley talked about. And there's Stan, there's something there. And typically, that time of the year in October, they turn and head north. Stan's coming south, that's coming north. Not a good combination, Stan. Why don't you wait 24 hours? 24 hours later, we had a tropical storm. 48 hours later, we had a hurricane. Stan waited. But once again, he, he looked at one model, the other model had it, the other one didn't. It was the satellite picture that basically clinched the story. So if you're in a tropically active area, you've got to stay alert, constantly alert. So the Central North Pacific is an interesting story as well. It's in the 2016 Pacific Cup, which goes from San Francisco down to Honolulu. There was a hurricane that went right through the fleet. Central North Pacific is normally very, very quiet. But on occasion, the water temperatures get very, very warm. And when these systems form off the Mexico coast, they normally dissipate. But on those rare seasons where it's warm, they don't dissipate. And many times, they'll start to intensify near Hawaii. How's it looking for this year? <laughs> it, the, the, I tell you to look up the water temperatures, and you can answer that question. But the water temperatures right now are below normal. And they're so far below normal that the odds of them being above normal by July are, 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 are very slim. So very, very important. No, it, so Hawaii is normally tropical storm free, but they do occur there. The West and North Pacific, if you're over there, they can happen any time of the year. In fact, there's one happening right now. And we had a client long ago that decided was going to spend Thanksgiving in the Philippines. He dodged three typhoons. So west and north Pacific, very difficult. Southern Indian Ocean, 
late January through March. We have a lot of clients that like to go to Cape Town in the winter time. They come from Australia, which means they're going across the Indian Ocean during the peak of the hurricane season. Now I'm gonna test you guys to see if you were paying attention to Ken McKinley. If you were going across the Indian Ocean in the middle of hurricane season, what latitude are you guys gonna sail at? Five? <laughs> Correct, five. Five or higher. And that's what we do, we route everybody near the equator, but unfortunately at some point in time you gotta dive southwest because Cape Town's at 36 south. But yes, very good. So you try to get as close to the equator as you can and stay there as long as you can and then you say a prayer and dive as fast as you can towards Cape Town. So the South Pacific Ocean is right now, and the peak of the season is not Fen, but February and March. Um, and in both cases, the Indian Ocean and the South Pacific Ocean are slightly busier than the North Atlantic. So the key is avoid peak season. Have a plan of action, guys. What are you gonna do if a tropical cyclone forms? So your, your vacation in Antigua, what are you guys gonna do if a cyclone comes like Irma? Understand the average tracks, how they're gonna move. Great diagram from Ken. So if you're in Antigua, you're not gonna head towards St. Thomas, right? So your best course of action then, Trinidad, head south. You don't wait until the last minute either. Implement, implement your plan of action at least three days in advance. Gives you tons of time. They're relatively small systems, and the worst of it's in a small area, but you don't wanna wait until the last minute. And then travel at right angles to the path. You're not just veering off a little bit, you're getting away, period. And really, if you're on land, leave the boat. It's not important. So we've been getting a lot more clients that have decided they like to go to Antarctica and up in the high latitudes now. Uh, and, and I'm gonna finish up with more normal stuff. But ke keep in mind, if you choose to go up there, that summer comes late and fall comes very early. So the good season is very small. It can be absolutely gorgeous up there in August, but there is always ice, even in areas that tell you this, the ice is not there. Ice out will occur in August and early September, but the ice is coming back very quickly by October. So we had a big client of ours in Great Britain wanted to highlight global warming. And they came up with an idea that they wanted to do an open 40 race around the North Pole. I'm serious, don't laugh. Now, it'd be very easy if all the ice melted, you could do, go right around the North Pole in about two hours if you could get real close. But the problem is, that where the ice melts, you're only at about 65 to 70 north. So to do the entire trip, averaging 180 to 210 miles a day, which is not always possible, it's 30 to 40 days. So that meant that they would have to start the race somewhere that didn't have any ice in the middle of October, uh, August, and hope they got done before October. So I, I did a feasibility study on this. You know, the, um, I took a look at the normal temperatures. And as you can see, in, in August, the normal temperatures are not great, but they're not bad. And um, Barrow, Alaska is right here. So the average high temperature in Barrow, which is in the north side of Alaska, is 43 degrees. But by September, it's, the average temperature is 34 and the average low is 27. 
So I, it was like, guys, I'm not sure this is going to work. Um, so my suggestion was, is why don't we take an open 40 and just try to do the Northwest Passage one day, one year, one season, and see how it goes. Because the worst thing, if, if you want to highlight something, you don't want to turn it into a disaster. So I convinced the guys, we're, what, let's take the open 40 up and we'll do the Northwest Passage. So they left from the Azores, came up along the Greenland coast, they decided to refuel here. They were going to go over to Pond Inlet, where they were going to pick up the sponsors who were flying in from Great Britain. Then they were going to do the Northwest Passage and see how bad it really was. So the prevailing winds in Greenland during the summertime are northeast or east, coming off of the glaciers. You'll get a very weak sea breeze in the afternoon, very light westerlies. When the winter comes, you're getting the big fronts to come through with the strong west winds. So the pattern changes once you get into the winter. So anyways, we worked our way up, and it was not an easy trip. They decided they were going to pull into Iliasat, which is right here, to get fuel before they did the Northwest Passage. They weren't sure they were going to get fuel up here. As they were heading in, the ice out area, which had been ice out since July, there's chunks of ice up there. So they had two guys up on the bow with boat hooks pushing the chunks of ice away. They were moving at about a knot and a half to get in. And that was approximately August 25th. And we were running out of time to do this entire transit. We didn't want to be here in October. It took a long time for them to get in, and it looked like this big front was coming. And they were telling us, they were sending pictures about all the ice that was out here. They, they were winding their way through, and I'm there, geez, if we get a strong west wind, there's going to be a problem in there. I said, you better get behind the breakwater tonight. Said, I don't know if this is going to happen, but logic says all the ice is going to come in. So anyways, he sent this picture the next morning. Here's the breakwater, and they were in here. Several of the um, sailboats sank in here. So here's the fuel towers out here. Here's the fuel towers here. As far as they could see, there was ice off to the west. They sat there for three days before they could get back out. So we finally got out, and we're now heading this way. It's only about 420 miles. And we actually had, um, we had a light easterly, and then we had a southerly, so we were going on really well. And then a big front came in. And it was basically 40 knots on the nose. Temperature fell to about 25 degrees. It was snow like hell. The clients could not fly in. The airport was closed. We bagged the entire trip. No more open 40 races, D, around the Arctic <laughs> Circle. So if you're going, if you're taking a trip down to Antarctica, I suggest you go with Skip Novak. He understands it. But if you're going there, go in January and February. If you're going up to the, the cold areas, up to the north of us, Labrador, Greenland, make sure you do it in August. OK? The season is very, very short. Now, I get a lot of questions on deliveries down to the Caribbean. What is the best time of the year to do it? Keep in mind the hurricane season is September through early October. We get late season hurricanes, like the one that Ken showed us, that went the wrong way. Don't forget the perfect storm. There was a hurricane that did a 360 around Bermuda as well. So Bermuda had storm force winds from every direction in 24 hours. So you can have hurricanes. But keep in mind that the big winter storms become more frequent and stronger once you start to get into late November and December. And this year, when winter started so early and was so severe, not only did we have the big winter storms, but we had a ton of ice. 
So to me, the, the optimum time is sort of a compromise, late October and early November. But we, we joke about this in the office. It's really not funny, but some of the biggest storms we ever have seen at Halloween, the perfect storm, the Hurricane Sandy storm, the gale that occurred this year. For some reason, right around Halloween, you, you get the very first big storm of the season. But still, I sort of like the idea that going down to Bermuda, try to get the boat down to Bermuda early, realize there's a risk of a late season hurricane in Bermuda, but you've got the boat in Bermuda early. The earlier you go, the more benign the fronts are, the larger the wind, weather windows will be. You know, the weather systems aren't coming by every two to three days. But also keep in mind that the shortest route is not necessarily the direct route. So if you can only find weather windows two or three days, if we can't get to Bermuda without getting clobbered, how about if we go down to Norfolk? How about if we go down to Beaufort? Go down to Charleston? There's just one thing you've got to remember, though. If you go down there, you still have to get the easting in. But the beauty of that is you're going to be close to the Gulf Stream, easier crossing of the Gulf Stream, and you're into the warm water a lot faster than if you're leaving from up here. So just keep in mind that there are other options than the direct route. And a lot of times, this other option is faster because you're not sitting in Newport for so long. But keep in mind, as we get later in the fall and into the early winter, the weather's going to get worse and worse. It won't get better and better. So anyways, here's just a couple of the routes, the direct route down to Bermuda and then down to the Caribbean, and the other option. But always keep in mind, if you come down to Norfolk, we've got to get the easting in, always. I take that back. Not always. I've seen Southerlies down there too. So. Can I ask a quick one? Sure. On that route you just showed us, over with climate change and whatever, are you seeing that change over the last few years? Do you think it's going to change? Because I, I know a lot of people in this room have done boats. And I'm finding the same thing you're talking about. Go south then east instead of boat system. Yeah, I, 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 what I've found is that as time has gone on, as time has gone on, people have become more open to other options. I think they've been... I go out for the Transpac out in the California every single time. And the old wise tale is you never go north of Great Circle. Never, ever, ever. Don't even think about it. But there's been a, the last few races, we've been up fairly close to Great Circle. And there's a reason for that, is because we've got more weather knowledge. The weather models are more accurate. We know what's going on. 20 years ago, we were sort of defaulting back to normal. So I, I think it isn't that the weather patterns are changing, but people are becoming more comfortable with other ideas. So in the spring de delivery season, keep in mind, it's always going to get better. And, and what's very interesting, if you look statistically at the, the lowest barometer readings on the east coast of the United States, they're typically in March and early April. The biggest storms occur in March and early April. So if you're going to bring your boat back from the Caribbean in April, and you're going to take the direct route back, and the superstorm of 93 happens, you, you're really in a tough spot. So my suggestion is, is that, uh, and the other thing is, keep in mind that the prevailing winds are west, northwest, or north in the early spring. So you could get up to Bermuda and you're stuck there. So my, a lot of times if we can't find a good weather window and you want to leave, we head towards the Bahamas. So we come out of the Caribbean, we head towards the Bahamas. If everything still looks good, then we'll point up towards Charleston. If the weather pattern continues, it could be good. We point up towards Hatteras. But we have options to stop if we have to stop instead of doing the more direct route. 
And here's, here's one of those options. Just real quick. Um, spring and summer, when you're delivering to Europe, you only have to go as far north as you need to to stay in the westerlies. It's that simple. You do not have to sail Great Circle unless the high's up there. So you only go as far north as, as strong a westerly wind as you want. It's that simple. Keep in mind that the ice season varies from year to year. Sometimes there's no ice at all off in Newfoundland. The last two seasons, there's been problems with ice right into early August. Um, but keep in mind, the later you depart, the better the weather, the closer to the Great Circle you'll be able to go. And typically late June or July is the best time. I would not go in August, I would not go in September. You can, but keep in mind that one of the tracks is to turn up into the Atlantic Ocean with tropical storms and cyclones. And here's a couple of those routes. And as you can see, here's Great Circle from Newport to England. It takes you right up over the southeast tip of Newfoundland. So I wouldn't be in any hurry to do that in the springtime. And if you're over in Europe and you're in Scandinavia, the UK, don't hang around up there until November. You'll never get out of there. So the further north you are, the earlier you have to leave to get south. Um, Scandinavia, early September, you're probably okay, but uh, Great Britain, you may be able to hang out until early October. But don't wait too long because you, you can get stuck up there. And if you're coming out of the Mediterranean, the weather's fine, generally there in September. The Volvo leaves from there in October. Another interesting thing, um, crossing the Atlantic, sometimes you can make out pretty well in October, but keep in mind that you gotta watch for tropical cyclones if you do a transatlantic in October. In November and early December, crossing the Atlantic can be very difficult with very light and non-existent winds. I think DU did the, um, uh, the uh, transat there with the, the end of November and it was relatively light for part of that when you did it. So light winds and headwinds can be a problem doing the transatlantic in November or early December. And a lot of times, if you wait until January, Christmas trade winds have come in, and you can have 20 to 30 knots downwind all the way across. So I wouldn't be in any rush um, to, cr to come across the Atlantic in the fall. So really, the most important point of all of this, weather models are confusing but a tremendous tool. But don't try to do something out of the season. Plan ahead, be prepared, and know what you're doing, and, and you'll, you'll end up fine. Thank you very much. Yep. This is simple.